Default mock behavior determines which default values are assigned to the fields of our mocked objects. So in this video, we're going to look at how we can modify the default mock behavior. So when we create a mocked object, the fields that it has can either be null by default, or they can represent mocked objects. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more weekly videos on Java, please subscribe to the channel. Okay, so if we take a look at the class we'll be testing, it's called animal. And the animal has an object called zookeeper, and it also has a primitive integer of an age. So the zookeeper will be instantiated through the constructor. And then we also have a getter for that zookeeper. And then if we look at the zookeeper class, it just has a single name, which is a string, which is instantiated through the constructor and also has a getter. So it's going to be this animal class that we create a mock of. And this is how we're going to change the default behavior of how that mock is created. So let's go into the animal test class. So our test class uses the Makito JUnit runner class and that will instantiate our mock for us. So I'm going to begin by creating a instance of the animal. I'm going to call it lion and it's just going to be a very simple mock. So when we create a mock class, if I go back into the animal class, all of these values are now going to be nullified. So if we have any kind of object, it's now kind of going to be represented as null. And then if we have a primitive value, they will all be defaulted into the value of zero, or if we have sort of a double, it would be zero D. And then for the getter down below, that will also now return null. And this is essentially what that mock class will be doing to our class. So now if I do a print line for the line.getZooKeeper, and the lion's age, we can expect it to print null and then the value of zero down below. So what we're seeing in the console is where objects are now being defaulted into null and then the primitive values generally become zero or if it were a Boolean, that would now become false. So Makita actually allows us to change the default behavior by using a second argument for the inline of our mock creation. So where we create this animal class mock, we can actually pass in a second argument, which will now change the default behavior of our mock. And the first one we're going to look at is called returns default. And returns defaults will not change the behavior of our mock whatsoever. This is actually the default application for our mock every time we create a mock. And if you prefer to use annotation based mocks, there is a key value pair which allows you to assign a value for this second argument here, and that's called answer. So that would look like this. But I'm just going to use inline mocks for this test class. So now if I print out the get zookeeper and the line age down below, we can expect it to print out exactly the same as we have for the first line that we created. The next modification to the default behavior we can use is called a smart null. And it performs in a similar way to our normal mock. However, rather than returning null down below, it's going to return something called a smart null. And essentially the smart null will tell us within the console, whenever we're trying to call a method on an object that is null, where we should be stubbing that method instead. So it's really useful as kind of a pointer to us to say, hey, look, you're trying to call a method on an object that is null, which has been caused by the mock. So you may want to instead stub this method so you're not just going to return null from that method call. So let's have a look at how this might work. So we have the return smart null second argument. So if I just print out get zookeeper on line three, we can see below that instead of printing null to the console, we have smart null returned by this unstub method call on a mock animal get zookeeper because we're calling the get zookeeper on our animal class and we haven't actually stubbed it to return any other instance of get zookeeper. So what I'm going to do is now create an instance of the zookeeper in our class that we can now return. And then I'm going to stop this get zookeeper method call just slightly above. 
So now Zookeeper John will be returned from this print line on line 32. So we can see down below Zookeeper name equals John has now been printed. And thankfully this smart nulls has just pointed to us in the direction of when a null object is being returned and where we might actually want to perform a stub. Now let's say we remove this stubbing up here and we try to get the name on the zookeeper that we have. So I'm just going to do system out and then line three, get zookeeper and then get name. And we can see down below that we have a null pointer and it has told us exactly what method has not been stubbed correctly. Now Mokito actually allows us to avoid any possible null pointer exceptions by replacing all the null objects with actual mocked objects that they would otherwise be. And this default behavior is called returns mock. And I've used the returns mock second argument. So in a similar way to a standard mock, returns mock will instantiate the primitive values to also zero, or if it's a Boolean, it will instantiate it to false. So I can just verify that by, by printing out the value. However, if we were to call get zookeeper on line four, instead of returning null, or instead of pointing to us in the console where we haven't stubbed a method, what it will return is essentially a mock version of that zookeeper. And we can see down below here, it says mock for zookeeper hash code and then the number for that hash code. And as a result, if we now try to call get name on that zookeeper, nothing is actually going to be printed to the console because it is a mocked instance. So rather than having a null pointer as we experienced with the smart nulls when we tried to call get name on the zookeeper, instead it's just going to print nothing. So if I do system out and then add the string of name, we will now see that nothing is actually printed where we're calling get name. And as a result, we're also avoiding that possible null pointer that we have within our test. So we can see down below for the last line that name is simply empty and we don't have that null pointer. So effectively by using returns mock, what we have down below is a stub for our animal class. So it would look something like this when we call the get zookeeper on line four, we would now return a mock instance of the zookeeper class. And therefore, when we call get name on that zookeeper class, just nothing is going to be returned to the console and it's just going to be blank without any possible null pointer exception. But let's say we wanted to stub this exact method call. So we don't really care about the zookeeper, but whenever we call the get name on the zookeeper offline for, we want it to return some type of string. And we can achieve this by using deep stubs, which is the final default condition that we're going to look at in this video. And I'm using the argument of returns deep stubs. So by using deep stubs, what happens is when we create this animal instance, this zookeeper is now going to be a mocked instance of the zookeeper. And the zookeeper that we have within that, it's going to have a mocked instance of this get name. And therefore it allows us to stub deeply within our instance of the animal to then return certain values for multiple chained method calls. So I can do when, and then line five, get zookeeper, and then get name, then return. And let's say we just want to return Alan. So if I do a system out on line five, we can now expect it to print Allen down below because this deep stub has allowed us to stub multiple method calls on our instance of animal. And let's say get name returned a different kind of object, we could then stub further into that to allow a very specific stubbing of our instance of the mock. So we can see down below that Allen has now been printed. So we've reviewed three different ways that we can transform our mock class 
but you may find that when you're testing your application code, you probably won't actually need to change the default behavior of your mock, but they can be quite useful for when you, uh, let's say if you're debugging a certain mock that you've created and you want to understand uh, why certain values are coming back as null. But I think understanding that you can actually change the default behavior of your mock instances can be quite interesting to understand.